Megan McCain, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, Katie, thank you so much for having me. And, um, you know, I just like, I've known you so long and I'm such a fan of all your work and I'm so flattered to be here. I actually just saw some clips of an interview you just did with Jen Psaki that's all over the internet. And I was, I had, a, I went to a play date with a girlfriend over the weekend. She was like, I just saw this amazing interview with Katie Kirk. And I was like, I'm going on her show next week. So it's there. Well, you know, I really appreciate you sitting down with me because Megan, I know we disagree on a number of issues, but I don't know about you. I really don't want to live in a country where half the population doesn't talk to the other half of the country. And so I, what my goal today is for you and I to hopefully model a conversation marked by respect, uh, kindness, and open-heartedness, which really isn't a word. Um, But I I think in a way, I want you and I to be a bit of a social experiment for our time. (laughs) So so thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. We have so much to talk about in so little time. So I thought I would just dive right in and ask you about the Instagram post. I, I'm on Instagram, <laughs> I think, 18 hours a day. Sadly, I've got a real problem, Megan. <laughs> but I was struck by your post, I think it was three days after the election. And I'm going to read the first two paragraphs if I could, and then we can talk about it. You wrote, I cannot, ex- I cannot express how validated I feel about my politics, my values, and my record of warning Democrats publicly for over a decade that their elitism, socialism, and overall social insanity is alienating the country as well as just as well as just is incredibly dangerous and anti-American on a policy level. My entire adult life, I have had abuse directed at me simply for being a proud, strong, conservative woman who wouldn't back down. I've been yelled at it in restaurants, been socially ostracized almost everywhere except in conservative circles, been subjected to toxic work environments beyond comprehension, been accused of being a traitor to my gender, and more than I have time to write here, all because I have refused to be quiet and I am a Republican woman. Um, You know, I read that and I wondered, actually, I I don't think I read that many comments because I think you had just posted it. But tell us a little bit about the reaction to your post. Well, I didn't expect it to like get quite as much attention as it did. I think it's one of my most, uh, the most comments written on a post ever, except for things relating to my dad when he had cancer. it came off afterward. My, I have some friends in my life who really didn't like it, and they thought it was like tonally sort of not appropriate. But I feel like I was just really letting off feelings that I've felt for a really long time. And I don't normally, I try and be like a Christian woman who shows a lot of grace. But in that moment, I was like, I feel like I have been warning that a tsunami is coming for a really long time and been told I'm crazy. And then the tsunami came. And I was, and it's like I've been trying to tell everybody this is going to happen, and Trump's going to get reelected, and and he's and people really hate what's going on in the country, and um, you know, I, I've basically been not everywhere. It's an exaggeration. I'm a little dramatic, Katie, in general. So, <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but I just feel like you know I've taken a lot of heat from a lot of people, and a lot of personal things have happened to me in the past few. I'd say like five years, ten years, whatever, and um. I just was trying to say that, like, if we don't if we don't reset in general in the country, that this is only going to get worse. And I did up my own podcast with a friend of mine who's very uh, progressive and we discussed the post. And I was like, sometimes I'm never a schadenfreude person. But in that moment, just processing the election, I was like a lot of things I said were going to happen came true. I wondered, Megan, if you could share a little more about your experience being a conservative woman in media. You were the token conservative, if you will, on The View from 2017 to 2021. Can you talk a little bit about that experience uh, over those four years? Yeah, I mean, people are always curious about this, and I understand because um, there's a lot of like sort of storied history. I did not have a great ending in the show. I'm one of, I'm really proud of the fact that I'm one of two hosts in the history of the show that quit and wasn't fired, me and Meredith Vieira. Um, In the 28-year history, that's pretty cool to leave on your own fruition. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been the token conservative on many shows. I was a contributor on MSNBC. I did this uh, millennial talk show with our friend Jacob Soberoff in L.A., and I was always the token conservative. And for a long time, it was fun, where I liked sort of working with respectful people that wanted to hear my opinion. I wanted to hear theirs. And then in the era of Trump, things really shifted, where I kind of felt like I was an avatar for all the hate and anger and frustration about Trump being filtered onto me. And when I started working at the show, I was very nervous to work there in general because it doesn't have a great reputation. Um, but my dad talked me into it. My dad was like, you can't not do this. It's a huge platform. It's ABC News. You know better than anyone, the power of network television. Um, and as time went on in the Trump administration, um, things just got progressively uglier, both on the show, on the content we were making, and then backstage as well. And in that period of time, I always tell people I was like not the best version of myself for a lot of different reasons. I've had fertility struggles. I've had three miscarriages. I had my first one when I was on the show. My dad was dying of brain cancer. I was a caregiver to him. There's a lot of like drama in my life at the same time that Trump was attacking my family publicly. So I had I was just very emotional at the time in general, but I felt like I wasn't given grace from the people running the network or my colleagues at the time. And it's it's very tragic that it ended the way it did. I really tried to sort of save myself and save save what I felt like was okay for the show. But now there's a report out in the New York Post yesterday that the ABC executives are panicking because they don't have a real conservative person on the show and they're looking for someone to fill that void. And I was always saying it's you may not like it, but it's an important role. And the demonization of Republican women, I think, is there's a direct through line between how I'm treated or was. And again, I this is a broad generalization. There's lovely people in the media on the left that are very kind to me. Uh, and I this is just my specific experience on the show. Uh, but I think there's a direct line between seeing the treatment of people like me and Trump now. And do you feel like you were just sort of perpetually disrespected? I have to say, I'm I'm not a regular view. Uh, I'm not a regular watcher of The View. But I remember when you were on and you were outnumbered. And uh, did you feel that that people were open to you or that they automatically attacked you if you opened your mouth? The hardest part about working on that show is actually how bad the leaking in the press was. In the first two weeks that I worked there, there was an article in the Daily Mail and the New York Post about how my nickname on the show was Elsa the Ice Princess because I was an ice bitch. That's a direct quote. I'd been working there, I think, 10 days at the time. And I could never have any private experiences backstage without it automatically going to a tabloid. Interestingly enough, that immediately ended when I left. Um, and it's hard to maintain any kind of trust when you're already feeling like an outsider. And then you have a private conversation saying it's there was another article I remember because, you know, you remember when it's about you. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I I, <laughs> I I know the feeling. It's horrible. It's really horrible to be because I'm you know, I would love I'm a communicator. I would love to work things out privately. But when you're having a conversation and you're saying it's so hard to be a Republican on the show and then. I can always remember when I left the show going home or going to dinner with friends and there was always like a three hour period of time where I would be so tense. What's going to hit a tabloid about me that's ugly? And it's just it's just not a productive way to be in any any place. So, yeah. And I felt very, um, very misunderstood by people. And it's tra like it's tragic. Look, I'm 40. I'm a big girl. I don't regret doing it. I wouldn't like undo it. Um, but well, one of the last conversations I had with them was you really need to fix this anger and this this aggression towards women who are unlike you. Um, and it, you know, obviously didn't make any difference at all. You know, I know, Megan, you're a lifelong conservative, but you're not really a, a part of the MAGA movement. In fact, you are what they call in Arizona a McCain Republican. And that's not necessarily said in a complimentary way these I days. I saw you speak at, at, a, at a women's conference that I was also at. Can you talk about what has happened to today's GOP and the MAGA takeover of the party and what it's been like for you personally to witness this. 
Well, I always joke. There are dozens of us. There are dozens of McCain <laughs> Republicans. <laughs> That's like a meme from Twitter. Like, there are dozens of us. Um, look, I have my personal reasons for not liking President Trump that everyone is aware of. And I also have policy and just character reasons for not liking Trump that a lot of people in the country do. Yeah, McCain Republicans are thrown around by, I just use the example of Carrie Lake, the woman who ran for governor and lost and who just ran for Senate and lost. And she literally said when she was on the campaign trail, if you're a McCain Republican, get the hell out. And then she ended up losing by around, I think it was 12 points, which statistically, there are 12 percent of people in Arizona that consider themselves McCain Republicans. So do that math, whatever you want. Um <clears throat> I always it's look, it's complicated and it's difficult. I have friends who are more than likely going to work in the Trump administration. And I literally had a conversation with one recently where I was like, I hope your relationship with me doesn't hurt you. Um, and it's a horrible tr in the same way that like the left is tribal. The right is just comparably tribal as well in, in all ways. And um, it's 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 sad and it it has been personally difficult and also just politically bizarre to feel like you've done something wrong because I'm not a MAGA Kool-Aid drinking populist and I'm never going to be. And I and that's OK. Like it it's OK. Like I don't think I've done anything wrong, but it certainly makes you unpopular in a lot of spaces. Well, why do you think it caught fire in the way it did, Megan? You know, that that, as you say, there are dozens of McCain Republicans. <laughs> you could say the same thing about, you know, Mitt, a Mitt Romney Republican. I guess what we used to call Rockefeller Republicans, right? It's so fascinating how the parties have really been turned upside down. But but why do you think Donald Trump, and then I'm going to talk to you more about him, has, has um, such a hold on so many people in this country? I mean, a lot of different reasons. I think the one of the smartest things he's ever said is they're not after me. They're after you. I'm just in the way. And I think there's just a feeling of a lot of people in the country who, you know, are living paycheck to paycheck, who have been screaming at the top of their lungs that inflation's killing them and they can't. I have a friend in my life who couldn't go on a summer vacation this summer because of the amount of money she was paying extra in gas and inflation and interest rates on her believe health insurance can't remember she said health or car insurance and you know her husband's gainfully employed um so i think there was just a feeling that people are not being heard uh the needs of the lower middle class are not being addressed and that trump continues to say i'm an outsider i i am gonna fight for you and people believed it and i i just think there's been a lot of mistakes done along the way uh by from democrats running for office and and governing in a world they want to see exist and not the one that actually exists. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have thought about your dad so often, <laughs> Megan, during this election cycle. I'm sure you think about him every day. But I was one of many people who deeply admired him for his character, his service, and of course, his wicked sense of humor. Um yeah. You know, you talked about personal reasons for disliking President Trump because he has disrespected your father repeatedly. He said he's not a war hero uh, because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured. He was furious when your father uh, was the deciding vote to not repeal Obamacare. He reportedly was apoplectic when the flags were flown at half mast after your dad. I think it's actually half staff if it's on ground and half mast if it's at sea, mm -hmm. uh, half staff after your dad died. Um, your dad specifically instructed he did not want Donald Trump at his funeral. And and all of this, I mean, you loved your dad so much. I love my dad so much. I can't imagine how painful, honestly, all of this was for you. So I'm curious, and and I you've probably been asked this a million times, but what do you think your dad would think of Donald Trump's campaign this go round. He died in 2018, so he didn't see this Donald Trump 2.0, which is kind of Trump on steroids, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, what what would he make of it? This is not his style. And I think anyone that's, you know, ever seen anything that he ever did, he was always, you know, so bipartisan and trying to work with the other side to his detriment. I mean, he was called a rhino and attacked by people like Rush Limbaugh throughout his entire career. So even when he was alive, he was sort of the McCain Republican figure that he is now. Um, he would be heartbroken. Um, but he also was stoic in in the 
in everything. And I remember when Trump was first elected, I was I was very scared uh, because that time I did not. I I thought he had a likelihood of winning. I didn't think he. But then secretly, I was like, I don't think he's really going to pull it off. You know, it's Hillary Clinton he's running against. And I remember the next morning calling him and he was like, I know what's going on. Get up and go to your window. And I was like, OK. And I was living in New York and I was still single at the time. And I went up and looked out the window and he goes, do you see all those? mother blanking pigs flying everywhere that's what that's what's going on the pigs are flying <laughs> outside that's what's <laughs> happening and he always maintained this like really acerbic dark sense of humor so i think he would have maintained his acerbic dark sense of humor but i think he would have been a conscience for the country in the way he always was but i also think that he would have had a i think he would have been really demonized the way like amit amit romney had been and the look up my dad dying gutted me and i always feel like the point in my, there's like before my dad died and after my dad died. And I, I didn't become a different person, but it just hardens you and ages you when you lose anyone to brain cancer, anyone who's experienced it. You just become a different version of yourself. And there's a part of me that's happy he's not alive to see all this because it would have broken his heart so badly to see the divisions in the country the way they are. I so appreciated this decorum and this character that your dad always exhibited. I didn't necessarily agree with all of his policy positions, but I was so grateful for the way he conducted himself. Um, I mean, there couldn't be a greater contrast between him and Donald Trump. He's the last of the great ones, I believe. I think his passing, my husband always says it, it was a generational shift. It was like the ending of a very specific kind of generation that still cared about character and ethics and morals and look he was far from a perfect person he would say that to your face right sure you him a million times you would know that like he certainly had his faults but um you know he i think he was the i i worship my dad so there's never, you're never <laughs> gonna get me to say anything really negative uh, i mean i see him as a real person but you know you're never gonna get me to say anything negative about him but i i think the, one of the things that i miss the most about my dad because people ask me all the time is as you said his humor he maintained such levity in dark situations, even when he was, you know, I remember when he was running for president, it was clear he wasn't going to win. And uh, some journalist, I don't remember who, like, got up in his face and was like, is this going to be so hard for you or are you in a dark place? And he was like, he was like, excuse me, I've been through way worse than this. <laughs> and, you know, obviously what the implication of that is, he was tortured for five and a half years. And he just always maintained this humor and humor is gone from politics in general right now. And I think or it's been replaced with this kind of weird, sick, hurtful humor, I think. Yes. Yes. The the negging, punting, you know, bullying humor. I was talking to someone recently, Megan, I was curious about your take on this um, about Lindsey Graham. I don't even remember. You know, I talk to so many people and I read, so, <laughs> I read so many things. But, <laughs> you know, someone said Lindsey Graham always relied or depended on John McCain to give him a spine, right? Wow. And, Who said yeah, that? And, and then after your dad died, he became spineless because he didn't have someone to look up to like your father. And of course, I, I'm old enough to remember the three amigos, you know, your dad mm -hmm. and Joe Lieberman and Lindsey Graham. And um, as you watch sort of Lindsey Graham become sort of sycophant in chief. <laughs> I mean, uh, what went through your mind? I won't associate it with him anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with Lindsey Graham. And there's some personal animus that he's very well aware of between us. And I just find him, you know, it's he's so far removed from the person I used to know. And I know from, you know, mutual friends we have, and I would like to say my mother still associates with him and my brothers do. This is like my personal choice. I'm just not comfortable around him because um, he loves talking to the press, too. He like, you know, there's very rarely you can have a private conversation with him that doesn't end up someplace. And I I really, you know, better than anyone else in your life, you really have to have people around you that believe in the concept of off the record, um, especially your people in your personal life. But he just he will go where power is in whatever form. And, you know, I think he'll get these like short term dopamine rushes from being associated with Trump. And I think he'll get this short term. But I always wonder what how he's going to feel at the end of his career. 
if this is all worth it, if morphing this way is all worth it. But maybe he looks at Liz Cheney and is like, look at her career. You know, she's out of power and she's demonized by so many people. And I don't want to be that. So I need to be like Trump and, you know, imitate him and be his best friend. And people all have to live with their decisions in life and the, you know, with their conscience and with their creator. And he disappoints me on many different levels. And I just I don't want to be around him anymore. You know, you you talk about sort of people having serious struggles, economic struggles, and how that motivated a lot of people to vote the way they did. Um, but and, and not to put too fine a point on it, because we sort of talked about this already, Megan, but it's fascinating to me and actually, I think, disturbing to many that that Donald Trump's behavior and actions, he never did anything that was disqualifying. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could shed some light on why you believe things like January 6th, uh, which Donald Trump called a day of love, his conviction by a jury of his peers of 34 felony counts, his asking the Secretary of State of Secretary of State of Georgia to find him 11,780 votes, his insistence that the 2020 election was rigged, despite the fact that over 60 court cases failed to find evidence of that. Why do you think all those things, this is what I'm still scratching my head about, Megan, didn't lead voters to think he was just simply unfit for office? I mean, and that's just, honestly, those are just kind of the headlines. There are so many other things underneath those those actions that I could have also uh, named. And, and why do you think people were willing to turn a blind eye to so many things that Donald Trump not only did, but what he stands for? I think there's a few different answers to this. The first one is the same friend. Um, I She felt sort of like, I don't know, guilty, but definitely like a little sheepish telling me she was voting for Trump. And I asked the same question. And she said, I paid $500 for groceries and $100 for gas this morning. I, I like something has got to change and I don't have the sort of I'm not in the same station in life that you are with the same kind of guardrails to to have that be my main priority, which I thought was a very interesting and honest answer. So I think for a lot of people, as James Carville says, it's just the economy stupid and they just want change. I also think people are like very scared about the border and very scared about a lot of these culture war issues and just seeing the world changing in a way that they don't like. And they've sort of come to terms with the fact that the person who's going to change it comes in this like really morally corrupt and character flawed package. Um, I also think uh, I had a conversation with Sean Spicer where he was bringing up the fact that, um, you know, there, Bill Clinton is still someone who is on the debate stage and I'm sorry, the convention stage um, for the Democrat Party. And he's someone who obviously has we don't need to go into it, but a lot of right. you know, sexual proclivity. I've thought, I've thought about that, too, but I just feel like they're not, you know, they're they're not comparable. I don't think it's the same either, but right. just relaying. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, what, I thought, I've wondered about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 the way I it mets out for me is that it just the 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 actions are 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 just you can't compare the two. I think also um, in this election, there are two there are two moments that I thought really, really did it for Trump. One of them was him his assassination attempt and the image of him screaming fight with blood down his face. And, you know, even for me, because I, you know, I do not like him. We are not I'm not a supporter. I wrote in not just whatever of him. But even for me, I was like, oh, my God, this man is like even when he's bleeding, he's like, I'm I'm fighting for you. And I think there was just never a comparably iconic image for Biden or or Vice President Harris going into the election. And then I think um, President Biden calling Republicans garbage. I really don't think you can underestimate what an impact that had. I knew a lot of people who dressed like in garbage trash bags at Halloween and uh, put like garbage person, trash person on their like social media and bios. And I think if you already think the elites think you're garbage, then you're not going to believe that they're going to fight for you if you're trash that's thrown out and you're, you're what you do and say doesn't matter. It's horrible that President Biden did it. Vice President Harris didn't do it. She never said anything like that. But unfortunately, I think the mistakes of President Biden hurt, hurt her very deeply. You didn't, you wrote in a candidate. I won't ask I wrote you. In who, my dad. 
how you wrote it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know, I know it's so, and people are mad at me. People are so mad at me, Katie. I mean, mad that I didn't vote either way. And I was like, I'm, I have such like Christian guilt at night and I don't want to, I don't want anything on my conscience with any of it. And I just, I can never vote for Trump. I can't do it. I could never explain it to my children. And you couldn't, and, and tell me why you couldn't vote for Kamala Harris. I just policy. I wa- I really wanted her to give me a reason to vote for her, and I just felt like it never happened. And there were some questions that she she just couldn't answer. And look, I'm a pro life, pretty hardcore conservative woman. And um, Governor Waltz was a big was way too extreme for me. He he re- he actually like scared me a lot more than she did. And why? Um, He's very radical on abortion and um, his record during 2020 George Floyd protests in Minneapolis. And um, I felt like he was cosplaying as a Republican to try and get my vote. It all felt very phony. Oh, although I have to I have to point out that Donald Trump called him and congratulated him for how he handled oh, yeah. the riots in Minnesota. Right. That's ridiculous. Yes. It's a completely no one represents me. Um uh, but I do think um, because people keep asking me, you know, did was she a good candidate? And I was like, she had 100 days to to do this. And I think she should be plotted for doing for getting in the cockpit of a crashing plane and leveling it out the way she did. I don't know how many other politicians could have done that. And I actually think that there are a lot of genuine criticisms of her that I can give. But I don't think she's this cataclysmic disaster that she's being portrayed as now. I think it's actually pretty unfair. I thought she, I mean, this is me. And of course, I'm more, you know, I'm more liberal than you are. But I I thought she carried herself with such dignity and intelligence. A lot of people I understand have said they think your dad would have voted for Vice President Harris. But you disagree with that assessment. Yeah, he he was like me. You know, I don't I don't think he would have like, you know, trashed her, been uncivil, um, but I don't think he would have voted for her. I mean, he 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 never voted for a Democrat that I'm aware of his entire life. And I just can't really see that changing. And I also think the Afghanistan withdrawal on the part of the Biden administration would have killed him, would have killed him. The images of the people hanging onto the plane and us leaving translators and allies in Afghanistan to basically fend for themselves and be killed. It would have, he would have had a nervous breakdown over it. And I think he couldn't have forgiven that. You also feel that, uh, Israel would have been a big factor in his vote. He was a huge pro-Israel person. And that's where I got a lot of my, you know, advocacy from. And uh, he, yeah, I think he just would have had a very different, and also the Democrats have shifted too. They're much more progressive than, you know, the era of the Joe Lieberman Democrat is, is long gone. Let's talk about what you wrote after the election Um, In addition to your early comments, you wrote, the big bright side for me is that I agree with President Trump on probably 75 to 85 percent of his policy positions, except the tariffs, of course. I'm still an old school fiscal conservative. So what are some of the president's uh, incoming president's policy positions that you feel comfortable with? Israel um, in general, anything having to do with culture war issues, which I'm sure you know, I don't know your audience, but I assume they're probably more liberal than mine disagree with. Um, um, I just think his emphasis on sort of like, uh, I, I too believe that everything in D.C. is broken and I'm I'm for radical change. One of the things I, I have, I want to emphasize, like my children are fully vaccinated. I'm grateful for vaccines and doctors and I I would never not vaccinate. Like I, it's very important to me. Um, I think anyone who's had a parent that died of cancer understands how magical doctors are and they're like you know magicians that do miracles every day but i too have questions about the food like what's happening with our food and the dyes being put in our food and you know why are some things legal in the you know why are skittles legal in the united states and they're not in europe like some of the questions that uh the make america healthy again uh movement has brought up i i have a lot of questions about um i think just Overall, I agree that I think D.C. needs radical change. And I don't know if I would have brought it in this chaotic package because, again, it's sort of like, be careful what you wish for. But right. Like um, and when you burn the house down, what are you going to you know, what come what rises from the ashes? We're going to talk about that in a moment because I want to ask you about some of these specific 
Sorry um, to jump around. Oh, no, no, no. I No, no, no. <laughs> no problem. It's a natural conversation. But one of my followers asked, Megan, how you felt about mass deportation. And I want to just give this context. President-elect Trump recently announced he would declare a national emergency and will use military assets to address illegal immigration through a mass deportation program. His top immigration policy advisor, Stephen Miller, has also said that military funds would be used to build vast holding facilities that would function as staging centers for immigrants as their cases progressed and they waited to be flown to other countries. But one major impediment to the vast deportation operation that the Trump team has promised in a second term is that Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, lacks the space to hold a significantly larger number of detainees than it currently does. Anyway, I just give that for for the way of background for our listeners. And um, gosh, I don't know, you know, obviously, and I think your dad was very involved in trying to address comprehensive immigration reform. I'm just remembering with Senator Ted Kennedy. Um, And that's something that obviously has been sorely needed, Megan, as we know, for decades and decades. But I don't know, when I hear about this and the images it conjures for me, it seems so inhumane and so cruel. And I know, you know, I don't know how you felt about the child separation policy, but honestly, this, I am not an immigrant. And on their behalf, this strikes such fear in my heart. And, um, but knowing again, full well, that our immigration system is broken. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, what are your thoughts? Well, first, I'm more dovish than probably the average Republican on this. I think anyone that's lived on the border state and, you know, that people are coming here because a lot of times they're escaping gang violence and, you know, just wanting the same opportunity. Civil war, right? Civil war, um, you know, all kinds of abuse. Like, you know, I mean, anyway. All the, not to get too dark, but all the things that are ugly and horrific in the world. Um, I think... The second there are images of children being ripped from their parents or families literally being separated, um, I think there it's one thing to talk about this in in the ether and to talk about on the campaign trail. I think it's another thing for it to actually happen. And I am actually curious when they say they're going to get the military involved. Does that literally mean like taking our, I don't know, the Army National Guard and going in and rounding up people? It sounds obviously very extreme. I always wish for prudence and calm and to understand that illegal immigrants in this country are God's children looking for a better way of life the way so many of us did. That way of thinking is is very passe when it comes to Republican circles. It's how I feel. It's how I'm always going to feel. Um, and I, I have great trepidation and I wouldn't go so far as to say fear, but I feel the way you do that. How does this work and what are the images going to look like? Because you know, any mother, it's a dystopian idea to have, you know, families being, being torn apart or somehow moved. And I think that it's going to be a really rough wake up call for a lot of Republicans if they actually end up doing this and the reaction of a lot of Americans. I also have questions about the Hispanic vote and the historic numbers of Hispanic people that voted for President Trump that weren't um, put off by this kind of rhetoric or this kind of policy, if they will feel any different if it actually goes in into action. I wanted to move on to the media writ large, which, you know, who know, what is the media anyway these days, sure. right? I mean, it. but you wrote in your substack, uh, corporate news media is a disaster. Here's how I'd fix it. Mm-hmm. I agree wholeheartedly. The media is a mess. Um, I think in some ways it's because of the fragmentation that's occurred with Uh, digital sources. And, you know, the good news, everybody has a platform. The bad news is everybody has a platform. That's sort of how I feel. But you outline um, some of the problems and your solutions. I'd love to get your hot takes. I hope that's not triggering from the view. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, on, on what you think needs to happen, because as somebody who's been in traditional media and now is doing my own thing, uh-huh. um, you know, I've I've given this a lot of thought, read a lot about it. I'm on the board of the Shorenstein Institute at Harvard. We, I just went to my first board meeting. Obviously, this was topic number one. So um I'm so sorry to be a Philistine. What is the Shorenstein Institute? Oh, I'm so sorry. it's 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 um, named after jo- Joan Shorenstein, who was a journalist. I think her parents named it. She died of cancer. And 
Um, I forget who she wrote for, but Nancy Gibbs, who I love, used to be editor of Time Magazine, who's a beautiful writer. She is the head of the Institute now, and she asked me if I would come and be on the board. So basically, really, it's about media and public policy and how we fix media. So this has really been top of mind for me. And I just interviewed uh, Michael Tomaski, who's the editor of The New Republic. He wrote a big article about sort of the power and the reach and the influence of sort of the right wing media industrial complex. So sure. I've heard sort of his point of view as well. So I would love to hear sort of what you think, what's gone wrong and how to fix it. And you have well, 30 seconds. I'm kidding. Oh my God. Well, you're, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. You're Katie Couric. So I feel like your, uh, you know, your perspective is probably more interesting than mine. You're, you know, iconic journalist. Um, you know, I'll give my hot take, but would you mind giving me your hot take too? Sure, sure. Uh, I think that for me, one of the things I outlined was I really am sick of the token Republican on panels on like places like CNN and MSNBC. I also don't like the token Democrat on on places like The Five. I, you know, have friends that work on that show and it's a great show. It's just not my style because I think that the politics of America is a kaleidoscope, especially like in my home state of Arizona. There are more independents and libertarians registered to vote than any other any other state in the country. And I think you're talking about the Democratic Party. You're talking about progressives, more traditional Clinton Democrats, McCain Republicans, MAGA Republicans, independents, libertarians. Like, that's what America is. And I think the old, uh, you know, sort of trope of just like one person and we pile on them is is very dated. Um, I just know from my experience, and I talked about this in my sub stack, um, that, and please, Subscribe to my Substack. Maybe yes. Substack.com. Thank you. I just launched it a few weeks ago. Um, the Substack's so fun, by the way, speaking of new media. Yeah. Really and, you know, a lot of people are making really nice livings writing for Substack. I think it's an yeah. awesome platform for a lot of people. Yeah, I've been really happy there. Anyway, uh, you know, I think for me, just having a different variety of journalists, I don't think it's good to only come from Ivy League schools and only have progressives and liberals at working. I talk about my Substack how two years into the view, I actually had to hire someone from outside to be my producer because it was just too hard to have people who didn't even, you know, sort of like tolerate. Speak Republican. your language, really. Yeah. So I would just be make it much more uh, diverse in all ways. And I mean that racially, politically. What Socioeconomically, back you know, back in terms of geographically, I think. Uh, that's one of the things we talked about at this board meeting, that diversity needs to include geographic diversity, you know, uh, life experience diversity, you know, small towns and uh, people who went to community colleges and just represent, as you said, the diversity of our country. Yeah, I also think respectfully, because there's a lot of people who are um, you know, have a lot of experience in media that I really trust and like a lot. Again, I it's not this is not a whole swath, but there's some people that I don't think do a good job that I think are just making things worse that don't I don't think deserve the platforms they have. And I would love to see some new blood hosting some places. And I just would also love to see, um, you know, there are there are journalists out there that are still true journalists. I mean, this is a very respectful conversation, Katie. You know, I won't always get that in different places I go to. And I think that just having people who are interested in the story and interested in what's happening in America versus, um, you know, projecting emotion in the way that is displayed right now is is really you know, counterproductive. I also have been just fascinated by this recent news story, not to date this this podcast, but, um, you know, seeing Joe and Mika Brzezinski yesterday talk about how they went to Mar-a-Lago to meet with Trump. I never thought I would see that happen. I was fascinated they decided to do that. Whether it ends up being good or bad for their career, I don't know. But I thought it was certainly an interesting signal and symbol that they they realize maybe they've gone too far and i i like them and we have a very good mutual friend and they've been very kind to me i don't have a problem with joe and mika i'm just saying i was interested yeah that's interesting i mean my quick take i mean we could talk about this for hours megan but i wish there would be less fight and more fixing um i think that journalism has gotten away from really talking about solutions and there is so much name calling, but I also feel that, you know, as the pie became 
the slices became smaller and smaller, right? The the model to have ratings and to get people to watch, people had to appeal to a certain segment of the population. Uh, that means that oftentimes people are getting affirmation instead of information, right? And Kara <laughs> Swisher calls it engagement through enragement. Now, I, 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 I blame Fox News a lot for this because I don't hear a lot of legitimate criticisms of Donald Trump on Fox News, and it does feel like a propaganda arm to me mm -hmm. of, of Donald Trump. Um, I think that uh, MSNBC obviously is talking to a certain segment of the population and probably mainstream media in general is more liberal than mm -hmm. conservative. Um, I think journalists tend to be more liberal thinkers. Um, and I think it's hard because opinion journalism has kind of taken over the space, right? Yeah. You don't necessarily have people kind of talking. And, and but, but I've also struggled with this, Megan, is that how do you cover Donald Trump accurately? You know, how do you search for truth? And how do you do fact-based journalism when he traffics in so much misinformation? And therein lies the rub for me. If you point out the things he says that are just patently false, then you're automatically labeled as biased. And that is, to me, the conundrum a lot of journalists are finding themselves in. Well, like, I felt like, a not a crazy person, but I definitely have this moment of one of the things I have to do, and I'm a conservative opinion commentator, so people know what they're going to get from me, but I'm not a... I'm not someone who drank Kool-Aid and can't see the forest for the trees in life. And I had a conversation yesterday about why is it that Matt Gates' ethics report isn't something I'm allowed to see when he wants to hold one of the most powerful positions in U.S. government. I don't understand. Why is Speaker Mike Johnson saying it's irrelevant? Clearly something's in it that's relevant. And the amount of people who are saying you're anti-MAGA, you're trying to hurt Trump, you're trying, you know, you're bad, whatever, just because I want to know what's in the ethics report of the very serious allegations against Matt Gates, That's the part that's when you're talking about on my side, that's the part that really scares me is getting in such a echo chamber and such a, a point that you feel like there will be social and, and uh, career retribution if you say something like that out loud. And I just feel like Sometimes I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. Like the fact that I can't have a conversation about why I think I wouldn't trust Matt Gates to babysit my kids, let alone be attorney general. Um, you know, to a lot of people, that's that's I'm saying something very untoward. Because you're not pledging blind loyalty and fealty to to Donald Trump, which is honestly kind of frightening because that is sort of the sign of an authoritarian <laughs> regime taking hold, isn't it? I mean, my first reaction, and I tweeted this when Matt Gates was chosen, is I was like, am I going to jail? <laughs> like, because I'm not. I mean, I'm joking, obviously, because I'm not a MAGA person. But yeah, it's really scary. And he's clearly, the choice is clearly made because Matt Gates is a sycophant who will do anything and everything that Trump wants. And to me, it's dangerous not to have checks and balances in positions of power. And I've just been surprised at people like Mike Johnson, who are supposed to be, you know, by all accounts, a deeply religious man. And I was told a more normal person in power. And, you know, he's taking the selfies on the plane, eating McDonald's, too. And I I don't know. I, I have as much criticism for my party as I do the left. I just I, you know, people have just been more interested in my criticism of Democrats recently because of the historic election loss. But I really fear I really fear the cult of personality and the amount of power everyone has going forward. I really do. I really like it. it it's really anxiety inducing. I wanted to read something by New York Times White House correspondent Peter Baker about what Donald Trump has been doing since he won the election. Peter writes, somehow disruption doesn't begin to cover it. Upheaval might be closer. Revolution, maybe. In less than two weeks since being elected again, Donald J. Trump has embarked on a new campaign to shatter the institutions of Washington as no incoming president has in his lifetime. He's rolled a giant grenade into the middle of the nation's capital and watched with mischievous glee to see who runs away and who throws themselves on it. Suffice it to say, so far there have been more of the former than the latter. Mr. Trump has said that real power is the ability to engender fear, and he seems to have achieved that. 
Mr. Trump's early transition moves amount to a generational stress test for the system. If Republicans bow to his demand to recess the Senate so that he can install appointees without confirmation, it would rewrite the balance of power established by the founders more than two centuries ago. And if he gets his way on selections for some of the most important posts in government, he would put in place loyalists intent on blowing up the very departments they would lead. He's such a good writer, isn't he? I'm like, it's very, yes, like a movie script. Um, I mean, do you think that this is what Republicans want and the people who voted for Donald Trump really want? I mean, he is going in there with guns blazing, Megan. Like, he wants to blow the place up, clearly. So anyone that's ever made an impulsive decision in their life, and I certainly have, I have a foot tattoo to prove it. (laughs) That moment where you wake up the next day and you're like, I have the most hideous foot tattoo. <laughs> I thought it was cool in the morning and I still, it's embarrassing. It looked like a blob. It's terrible. And I feel like be careful what you wish for is very important in this moment because I too want, I want radical change within the norm of understanding what radical change can look like. I do not want the foundations of the country imploded and I do not want people to feel unsafe or unheard. And I think the idea of taking a recess and not having normal hearings for these people is bat blank insane i know it's a family show i don't want to share oh no it's this is actually not a family show (laughs) you can't say it bad shit insane i think it's i think it's lunacy i think it is lunacy and i think we have a right to know who we are who we are putting in these places and again if the question i have for people not who want to do this in the recess what are you trying to hide what can what is so what can i not know um so i'm i'm very fearful of that i don't think all the people are going to be uh, destroying things from the inside out. I certainly don't think Senator Marco Rubio's intentions are that. I don't think the new head of transportation, Sean Duffy, who I know him and his wife very well, I don't think he's that kind of person at all. Um, so I do think there's some choices. Like Doug Burgum is a very lovely man from North But Dakota. those are kind of in the minority, aren't they, Megan? I mean, you look at Pete Hegseth, the Secretary of Defense pick. You've mentioned Matt Gates, where I think people, many people are appalled by that. I think there are significant concerns about RFK Jr. I know that you said your kids are vaccinated. I'm curious. I know you had him on your podcast. Um, if you're concerned about some of Have you interviewed his... him before? I haven't. Uh-huh. I haven't. In ed- ever before who he was now or? I've never, I've never interviewed him. I think I met him once when he did. De- you know, when he was primarily an environmentalist with river keepers and cared deeply about the environment. But um, no, I I don't run in those circles, Megan. I don't don't hang out with the Kennedys, even though I admire many of them. But but, I mean, a lot of people, I think the fact that he'll be in charge of the CDC, the NIH, the the FDA, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service, the Office of the Surgeon General, are very nervous, not only because of his claims that vaccines are connected to autism, which, I mean, the the MMR uh, vaccine, which has been disproven, as you know, um, and the guy who made those claims lost his medical license as a result of professional misconduct. Um, you know, I mean, people talk about the COVID vaccine, and there's a lot of, I think, retrospective thinking about what moves were made during COVID. But, you know, whenever people criticize that, for me, Megan, I think, well, what if all these kids had died? You know, what if there had been a very different outcome? And I think it's easy to say, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that. But if if something else, you know, science is not it's it's an art in many ways. You know, you learn as you go. This was a brand new virus. And I think that the medical professionals in charge did the best they could with the information they had. And um, I don't know, this whole like coulda, woulda, shoulda stuff, I think always gives me pause. And I, 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 like you, you know, I, I'm very touched by cancer, lost my husband and my sister. And I have such great and reverence for for science and for scientists that it's such an affront to me when people 
trash people like Anthony Fauci and experts. And everyone makes mistakes. I mean, it's just an imperfect, an imperfect um, exercise to kind of deal with something like this. But I don't know. I worry about RFK Jr., I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I understand how he became as popular as he is, because I think, again, like in hindsight, there's a lot of things that happened during COVID, which I would really blame much more on like teachers unions than doctors necessarily that really radicalized a lot of women in my life a lot, especially moms of young children. And again, like you said, hindsight's 2020, you know, go back in our time machine, whatever. But I do think one of the things that's really hard for me is the criticism of NIH. And again, I'm not like a bureaucrat. I don't know the internal workings of NIH. But what I do know is that when my dad had brain cancer. There's only a proton beam, which is this like tiny little microscopic beam that eliminates cancer. It, like they do the laser outside the cancer that makes it the tumors like collapse on themselves. And I remember that's where we took my dad to get his treatment there in Mayo Clinic. And I remember at the time being like, this is like alchemy. This is the craziest. The fact that this exists and this was invented and these nurses and these doctors can make tumors disappear with this laser is just the most miraculous thing. And at the time, I remember talking to so many doctors about the future of cancer treatment, as I'm sure you have too. And there's so much when it comes to uh, immune therapy and stem cells therapy and things that I'm so excited about and hopeful for. And of course, AI is going to change the field dramatically. Yes. And I think, again, the misunderstanding, if you've ever been in a state of sheer desperation, which you and I have been in, just wanting people to fix this for you and to give you hope. The thankless things doctors and nurses have to go through every day and caregivers, I just, that's what the problem, the biggest problem I have with all of this is that science, like you said, is a practice of medicine. And I mean, not to give you like TMI, but I had to have a hysteroctopy like uh, two weeks ago. And when it was happening, for people who don't know what that is, like the doctor puts a camera inside your uterus to make sure you don't have like polyps or anything. And I was like, this is crazy. In like 15 minutes, I can find out if there's anything wrong with my uterus. Like, what a world we're in. And I just feel like the disrespect towards scientists and doctors and things like that is very alarming to me. And I'm I continue to be so grateful for, for vaccines. And the, I actually well, texted they, you my... Know, I, you know, they have saved... I looked this up. They have saved an estimated 154 million lives since 1974 when the World Health Organization launched its global immunization program, the equivalent of saving six lives every single minute. It's amazing. And uh, as everyone or anyone who, you know, has my mother has talked about this, that, you know, there are African nations and places that don't have vaccines other than food and water. It's the main thing that they want from NGOs and places to go in and help their communities. And I just think it's a really excessive, decadent culture that doesn't appreciate what we're given. And when you hear about like outbreaks of measles and things like that, it scares the living hell out of me. People are worried about polio returning as well. I mean, given oh all the, that we've discussed, so do you feel confident that RFK is the right person? And by the way, I agree, like chronic health problems are killing Americans, all these things, obesity. I agree what you said about die. But, you know, there are ways to address these issues without blowing up the entire place. I, it's not my choice. It, it was not. It, he would not be my choice after I interviewed him. I, you know, he's a very pleasant and charming man. Um, but I just, it's it's a lot of it is just too woo woo for me. It's too like, uh, like, you know, I just really rely on doctors and scientists who have a lot of record and have spent their life dedicated to examining and studying health and medicine. And yeah, I, I, I look. I texted my pediatrician and was like, uh. Our vaccine? Am I still going to be able to vaccinate my kids? Like if he becomes, you know, the head of this. So it's it's not my. And what kid. did your pediatrician say? Yes, <laughs> she said yes. But she it is scary. I mean, we could get an. I asked somebody to write a piece for us. Uh, Jeremy Faust, who's an emergency room doctor in Boston, who I talked a lot to during COVID. You know, it it is like to leave vaccine, getting vaccinated, to make it a choice rather than a mandate. I think has some serious health public health consequences. I was reading a lot about this, you know, like strong encouragement or versus a mandate and kind of what works better. But 
you know, I think if you don't have this herd immunity, it can put a lot of people in the community at risk. I mean, I'm not a doctor or scientist, but I worry I worry about RFK Jr., but that's me. Um, listen, uh, no, I, I want to... And I also think just character-wise, you know, he... Again, this is not a family show, but, you know, he had some kind of affair recently with a journalist. And, you know, if that's what, how you're spending your time, I do wonder about, like, the focus on the issues of the nation. And I think, again, I'm, people are- I'm old-fashioned that way, too. Like, <laughs> I I like my public officials to keep it in their pants. Call I me crazy. I, and I'm, but that's, but you and I are in the minority, I guess. But I just thought, like, it's so recent and it was with a journalist. And, you know, I don't want people with high levels of intelligence and access to, you know. But there's all sorts of other weird stuff, like the Bear Cub and Central Park and all sorts of crazy shit. But anyway, all right, I wanted to ask you real quickly, because I know we're out of time and I've been taking so long talking to you, but thank you for that. I wanted to ask you about another uh, Donald Trump's picks, because she's a good friend of yours, and that's Tulsi Gabbard for Director of National hey, Intelligence. Everybody's asking me about her. Everybody's asking me about her right Really? Now. Well, I, um, yeah, I'm sorry to add to Add to the chorus, but I know she's your eldest daughter's godmother. Is, yeah. Um, but there, honestly, I've read a lot of stuff that gives me pause, and I wonder if you could talk about it. And those things specifically sure. are that she traveled to Syria and met with President Assad, uh, his the authoritarian authoritarian president of of Syria, who I actually have interviewed. Uh, the day after Vladimir Putin began a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, she blamed the United States and NATO for provoking the by, for provoking the war uh, by ignoring Russia's security concerns. And after she was named for her role, a Russian paper wrote a glowing review saying the CIA and the FBI are trembling and that Ukrainians consider her an agent of the Russian state. So, Megan, mm -hmm. tell us. Yeah, I think one of the reasons, so Tulsi and I met about eight years ago, and we actually met through Van Jones, uh, CNN's Van Jones, and he, I had been very critical of her meeting with Bashar al-Assad, and um, he texted me and was like, you you don't know her. And he texted her saying, because she, her campaign had answered in a very intense way and said, you don't know Megan. And he basically like set us up on a friend date. And um, in that lunch, our first meeting, I felt so seen by another woman. I felt like we were both bonded over what it's like to be demonized in the media. We we both had at the point gone through fertility issues and we're bonding over that. We both felt you know, very alone in so many media spaces. And I think the main thing that I know about her and I know her character, we're, we're very, very good friends. I talk to her almost every day. The main thing about her is that she wants peace in all forms and she will meet with Satan himself to get it. And I believe that every choice she makes in her life in general is all about trying to find peace and prevent war. I also want to know why Bernie Sanders has put out tweets saying this is a disgusting slur and defended her uh, against, you know, the accusations that she's somehow for Russia. One of my dear friends, uh, Vladimir Karamurza, was actually imprisoned in a Russian gulag for years. He was by a miracle helped to be released by a prison exchange with President Biden. And I think the idea that I would associate with someone who was compromised by Russia is insulting to me. And I also think that I wish everyone would sort of get out of the habit of um, saying Russia is involved for everything like Russia Gate, which ended up being nothing with President Trump. That doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, be very wary of Putin and Russia in general, especially with their. And there were some shenanigans, I think, in Georgia. There were 30 bomb threats uh, targeting black voters at a number of Georgia voting centers that were orchestrated by the Russians. God. So, yeah. I mean, you're right. We can't blame them for everything, but maybe we can blame them for a lot of things. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's very serious. I would never negate that. Um, look, she is someone who evokes very intense reactions on both sides. I love her very much. I know the person. I trust her implicitly. I was very happy when she was chosen because I don't I neither believe those things, and I think they're just pretty absurd. Um, and I also think she's getting a lot of heat because she's a former Democrat. Uh, but I believe she's going to be easily confirmed. And I think that people are going to have to come to terms with the fact that there are a lot of soldiers like Tulsi who have been, and including, by the way, both my brothers, who have been through generations of war, 
who are very war weary and have become much more isolationist in their view of America's role globally. Tulsi and I don't agree on a lot of things. We're actually very opposite in many ways. Um, you know, she's like hyper healthy, works out all the time. And like I eat McDonald's like it, we're very opposite in a lot of ways. But the core values of who we are are very similar. And I wish people would see the side to her that I know so well. And I feel like she never really gets the opportunity to be seen as anything in this like dimensional way that a lot of women in politics, particularly on the left, get to. And um, I love her very much and I'm very proud of her. And I understand that a lot of people have questions and I'm not her mouthpiece, obviously, but I just I'm good friends with her. And I she's a really good person and has helped me through a lot of dark times in my life. So you think she's misunderstood, but you don't really agree with some of her policies. Is that a fair assessment? Sure. But she but I agree with more than probably people think. But she doesn't agree with mine either. Like we have healthy you know, I wouldn't say arguments, but, you know, we've certainly had many conversations about politics in the past. But, um, you know, it is I don't know if you have anyone like this in your life. I just don't know anyone else who has been turned into a caricature in the media the way we both have by a lot of people. And, you know, at the time I was working on The View when we first met and I just felt really and she would say the same thing. We just I just felt really connected to her. And I just feel like I really, really, really know her. I really, really know her family. And she's a really good person. Well, you bring me to my final question, which is, how can we have more conversations like this? How can we have two people who disagree on a lot of issues and how we approach and tackle some of the thorniest problems in our country and have civil, respectful conversations. How can we encourage other people to do this, Megan? I mean, I always lead with love in every part of my life that I'm capable of. I'm not perfect, and I certainly have still have a temper, and I can still be like whatever. But I think age and having kids is. Ter I just want to have be in a world that I want my kids to be in, and this level of division is not is not, I think, tolerable or sustainable. And I think. Um, I'm open to, I will talk to anyone as long as it's respectful. I will talk to anyone on any side, as long as I know that there's not going to be screaming and name calling or anything like that. And I just think you can only lead by example and control how you behave and speak. And I also think we should reward platforms that, that have bipartisan conversations. Um, right in this moment, it's actually what I'm the most interested in listening to across the board. I'm interested in both sides coming together and discussing where we're at. And I think the reflection of how bad the ratings are on MSNBC and CNN right now show that maybe there's an appetite for more, you know, interesting, converse, nuanced conversations. Um, I'm people internal. aren't turning turning news off altogether, right? Uh, or when I say news, I mean like things like this too. <laughs> like, I mean, right. Like, no, no, no. But you know what I mean? I think some people just are so burned out on politics and sure. feel such a sense of despair, I don't know if they'd even want to listen to our conversation. I, I and I have friends like that who just can't even listen to it anymore. Um, but I'm I'm an eternal optimist. I really am. And I really hope for the better. And for me, the issues I have with President Trump and the division, I think that, you know, and I blame both sides for the division we're in. But for me, it's like there will only be four years of this. At least for me, one of the things that has given me solace with the anxiety I have about the Trump era is that there is an, an end point to this. After four years, he cannot be president again. And at least... At least not that we know of, right? Unless he tries to change God. the law. <laughs> Haiti, <laughs> Which I he mean, kind of suggested to members of Congress. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> it's like my sorry, first... sorry. We're back in the dystopian I know, mode. Sorry. Uh, for me, the end, the hypothetical endpoint has been has given me solace, and um, I really think there's a lot of really interesting people in the Democrat Party that are really being, you know, amazing figures right now, saying things I really am responding to and seem to really get it. So, like um, who? I mean, I love Senator Fetterman. He's my favorite Democrat. Um, Mayor Pete, I saw something uh, he did at, I believe Harvard. Maybe you were there at the same time, um, talking about the future, and he's just very. I don't agree with his so much of his policies, but I love his tone. It's very calm. It's very like nurturing. It's very like like I so intelligent. 
Yeah. And he just, he, he makes me, he relaxes me. I don't know if that, sometimes with politicians, it's just like their, their aura and their, their vibe makes you feel calm. And I, I think he has a really bright future. I always have. Um, who else? Seth Moulton. I think he made some interesting comments recently. Cory Booker. Uh, I still really think that he's like, you know, very measured and normal and will work with the other side. There's quite a few I would point to that I think are, are, you know, that unfortunately the most radical sides drown out the interesting things that they're saying. Well, Megan, I I could talk to you for a lot longer, but we've gone on and on. And I really appreciate you spending time with me. I've really enjoyed it. I was thank looking you. forward to our conversation and uh, I'm really grateful for it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. You're a legend icon. And I, I have a baby podcast where I interview people and I was like, there is a reason why Katie Couric's Katie Couric. This is like you are following up, doing like amazing <laughs> questions while research. I was like, there's a reason. Well, why I've I had I've had a lot of practice, you. Megan, like 40, 40 plus years. Uh, well, reason uh, so you'll, you, I'm sure you're doing a great job. But um, again, <laughs> you have a Substack, and what is your Substack called? MeganMcCain.substack.com, and I have a podcast called Citizen McCain, which is very bipartisan too. I've only I've, since the election, I've only had Democrats on, so. Well, look forward to listening to those episodes as well. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Katie.